I was at home one day when the telephone suddenly rang. I picked it up and um, this voice in Italian said, pronto? And I said, pronto? And um, a little taken aback, the person said, excuse me, but is that the uh, dry cleaners shop in Via Pezzana? And when she spoke, I recognised that this was a woman who I had been very friendly with during the years that I'd lived in Rome, but um, we had subsequently fallen out and hadn't spoken or seen each other for many years. And I said, um, Maura, is that you? It's me, Vida. And she said, Vida, what on earth are you doing in the dry cleaners shop in Via Pizzana? And I said, Maura, I'm not in the dry cleaners shop in Via Pizzana. I'm in London. And you phoned my home in London. Well, she was absolutely staggered, as was I, because as she went on to explain, she had no idea um, that I was living in London at all, let alone did she know my phone number there. And she phoned the dry cleaners at least twice a week, so she was certainly sure of their number. Well, as you can imagine, we were both absolutely staggered by this extraordinary quirk of electronic fate. And we really believed that it was for some sort of purpose. And we thought that it probably meant that we would renew our friendship in a way that was deeper and more valuable, you know, than it had been before. Um, but that didn't turn out like that. Um, and in fact, we haven't spoken or seen each other in four years. I'm a bookseller. I work in the book market on the South Bank in, uh, in London under Waterloo Bridge. And uh, I was setting out my stall one day. I had a big armful of books and I was setting them out one by one all along the table. And an old lady approached me and she came up to me and she said, uh, you know, what days are you here and how long's the book market been here, etc. So she was telling me uh, how the area had changed since she last knew it. She'd got married after the war, she'd gone to Canada and this was her first time back and everything had changed. She thought it was amazing. And I was talking to her and I was still laying out the books and the one I laid out was called The Language of Flowers. And she looked at it, she says, oh, I had a copy of that when I was a little girl. She says, I really loved it. It was a constant companion. I'd love to replace my copy. It looks very similar. And she picked it up and began to look through it, and I carried on just laying out the books while she did it. And when I finished, I looked back, and she was standing there with the book in her hand like this, and her hand, other hand on her mouth, and she was all sort of almost shaking, and something was wrong. And I went up to her, I says, what's wrong, madam? What's, what's the problem? She said, this, this is my book. She says... This is my actual book. Look, it's got my name in it, Hetty. But she says, how did you get the book? Because this, we lost this book in the Blitz. Our house was completely bombed. All our belongings, we just left them because it was, it was just a pile of rubble. We never took anything away. How on earth did you get this book? Because it is definitely mine. Here's a, you know, and she showed me the little annotations, and we were talking about the book. And she showed me the little drawing of a bush or a tree or something, and she'd put it there in the back. So she said, oh, I've definitely got to have this book. I just can't believe it, she said. So she pulled out a purse and was going to pay me. I said, oh, no, please. I said, look, I, honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't take that. Please accept it as a gift from a book center because it's a wonderful story. I could die this. I was playing George III in The Madness of George III by Alan Bennett at the Theatre Royal York about five months ago. In the play, George III is treated for his insanity by a doctor called Dr Willis. Just before curtains are about to go up, I start to get these chest pains and have a lot of difficulty with my breathing. So the cry goes around the theatre, is there a doctor in the house? Well, they manage to find one, get him up to the dressing room, he checks me out, pronounces me fighting fit, and I go on, give the performance, no problems. Later, I'm talking to this chap in the bar, asking his name, he says, my name's Willis, Dr Willis. I think, hang on a minute, that's the name of the guy in the play. That's not all he says. I am actually the great, great, great grandson of the original Dr. Willis who treated George III in 1788. About five years ago, my mother moved to a new house in the country and in the garden there was a barn which was going to be demolished and it was full, the, the chap who used to live there was a builder and the barn was full of bits of old wood and tools and, and lots of wood chippings on the floor. I was basically having to clear the whole place out, burn it, and uh, before it could be demolished. And uh, the garden was a mess too. We had a big bonfire at the end of the garden. And I'd taken a barrow load of stuff, chippings from the floor. I'd taken it down to the bonfire at the end of the garden, tipped it on. And I was standing there about two yards away from the fire, chatting. And there was this bang. 
and I felt something hit the side of my head and I put my hand up and I took my earring out of my ear and there was this .22 bullet which had been on the fire and had exploded and the cartridge embedded itself in my earring and um, obviously if I hadn't been wearing the earrings it would have got me in the neck and uh, at the time what I was quite freaked out by was the fact that, that it has the letter E on the bottom of it and my name's Elaine and uh, I thought this, this could have been quite literally the bullet with my name on it. I was walking along the road in Folkestone where I live and there was a phone box in the street ringing. Um, I don't usually answer phone boxes obviously but for some reason I decided to answer this one. Picked it up and there was a voice at the other end matter of factly saying oh sorry to bother you at home Jason but the fax machine's broken down, you know, can you help me fix it? And it was Sue, who I work with uh, at the AA in Dover. And uh, I sort of stopped her in her tracks and said, Sue, just a second, uh, you rung me in a phone box, you know, how did you know I was here? And she said, oh, stop messing around, Jason, look, we're really busy, how, how do you sort this machine out? And I said, Sue, look, I am, I'm in a phone box, you know, how did you know I was here? You know, what are you doing? And, uh, now, she just wouldn't believe me and I kept trying to convince her and gave up in the end. So I told her what to do with the fax machine, how to get it sorted out. And while I was telling her, she suddenly stopped me in my tracks and uh, said, Jason, Jason, uh, I haven't dialed your home phone number. She said, you live in Folkestone, don't you? I said, yeah. She said, I've dialed the Folkestone prefix, but I've dialed your staff payroll number. It's next to your name on the list at work. And I uh, sort of took, took all this in. And, and uh, basically, you know, that's exactly what happened. Uh, she dialed my staff payroll number, and my staff payroll number just happened to be the exact same number of this phone box that I, I happened to be walking past. I was on a train coming back from a day shopping and looking forward very much to having a cigarette. Uh, I lit a cigarette, and just as I did so, in came pile of Italian students who objected very strongly to the smoke and started to waft their arms about and cough and um, they made me feel very uncomfortable but anyway I persisted with my cigarette and eventually suggested that perhaps they'd like to go into another compartment because I was within my rights sitting here in a smoker they didn't and stayed with me all the way home and I was having very unkind and unchristian thoughts about these yobbos. And when I got home, I thought, I'm so upset now, I'm probably not going to sleep, but I did. And shortly afterwards, I was awakened by flashing lights. I got up, pulled the curtains back, and found that the lights were coming from a fire engine. And the fire was in the house opposite and I think it must have been at that moment that the fire brigade knocked at the door and lo and behold, who should come out of this house but my, my students from the train. And I was very surprised and I think at the same time slightly delighted that they too had been affected. 